Hello, ceramics. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the history of ceramic art. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is a little bit about archaeology. So archaeologists are people who study the past, usually by digging up remains from ancient cultures. And those people have discovered a lot about ancient peoples through their discovery of ceramics and pottery. And so everything before a certain point in time is called prehistory because it is before history was written down and recorded. So there is a lot of debate about different things um, and when they were invented and who did them first. So as we're studying um, the history of ceramic art in this discussion and lecture today, you might hear some things um, that you hear either differently in a different course in high school, or you might end up taking a art class or a survey class in college and hearing slightly different dates or slightly different cultures um, were the inventors of certain things. And that is completely normal. It doesn't mean that either of us were lying to you, um, but the information changes pretty regularly every few years or so if um, a new piece of pottery is discovered or they re-carbon date something. Um, so I'm going to give you the most up-to-date knowledge that I can um, based on my research, but that does not mean that if you hear something different, it is wrong. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give you that disclaimer going in. All right, so let's talk about the three age system a little bit more in depth. So um, basically we have three major ages that kind of defined human history um, early on. So it was based on the material that people discovered to use for weapons and tools. So the first stage, which is the longest stage is the stone age. So that would be when prehistoric men and women used stone for their tools. Think of things like um, hatchets. So the Bronze Age would have been um, after the discovery of bronze and humans started using bronze for things like um, dishes and also um, tools and weapons and then um, eventually armor. After the Bronze Age came the Iron Age. And so iron was a technological advancement for humans, and that was the shortest age. And then we get about to the time of Christ. And so those ages took place um, basically BC, um, and then the Iron Age is going on during the time of Christ and the change from um, BC to AD or, you know, BCE to ADE, whatever you call it. All right, so um, the last thing I want to talk to you about here is the division of the Stone Age up into three parts. So a lot of times you'll hear people talk about the Paleolithic era, the Mesolithic era, and the Neolithic era. So I'm going to divide pottery up into those three different eras, but all those eras took place within the time of the Stone Age. So kind of keep that in mind, that will affect people's use of pottery. All right, so the three ages, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. As you're watching this video, um, you are going to be filling in a handout that looks like this, that kind of goes through the PowerPoint. So um, sometimes I repeat things because they need to be um, on here. At any point, if you need to pause the video to take notes, that is totally fine. And then you can just hit unpause and keep watching. All right, so let's talk about the Stone Age first. So this is about 30,000 BC. And um, this is when early man invented weapons and tools to survive. Um, and this began shortly after human civilization started and ended, 
ended after the last ice age about 10,000 years ago. Now, keep in mind that all of this is, you know, um, very generic, general um, ideas of time. We don't have recorded history from this time. Um, we do have that humans did start to record some things because we have things like LaSalle Cave, um, so like cave art and things like that, but um, there wasn't written history at this point. All right, so let's initially talk about um, who invented pottery. So as far as we know, um, it was either China or Japan, and um, this was long before people started farming. They were actually making pottery out of clay. Um, the oldest dated pot in North America is from 30,000 BC, so the Paleolithic era. In um, 25,000 BC is when early humans settled in North America, and um, the earliest known ceramic sculpture, not pottery, is from the Czech Republic, and it's the Dolny Vestonice. And um, that is something that you may have been asked to draw by me before, but it looks kind of like the Venus, um, just totally blanked out. <laughs> it looks a lot like the Venus of Willendorf, but they are exaggerating different parts of the female form. Um, still kind of the same general idea. Um, it's a fertility symbol. And so um, certain parts of the woman's body are exaggerated. This would also be considered an ideal beauty at the time. Um, in 24,000 BC, ceramic figures were usually used for ceremonial purposes. So that's why you see a lot of these um, figures like this where they're fertility um, kind of talisman um, pieces. And then we have it in 18,000 BC, the earliest ancient pottery um, is discovered in China. So um, as of right now, the earliest pottery that we have carbon dated is um, this cave pottery that is found in the Xiangji province in China. And so um, that changes. Sometimes you hear Japan, sometimes you hear China. Um, but when I made this presentation, it was China. Um, all right, so people have been using clay for a long time. Um, we also see clay show up in Croatia. Um, we see clay show up in the Amur River Basin. Um, Mesopotamia and India was, were making tiles in 14,000 BC. Um, so sometimes people cite that as like an early use of clay. Um, you have Asian hunter-gatherers making pottery in 11,000 BC. Um, and then you also have the Jomon pottery or the Jomon ware that we talked about in Ceramics 1 showing up around this time. So like I said, this is before recorded human history, so um, we don't have a very clear view of who actually was using clay first. Um, but we will say that the first sculpture came from, like I said in the last slide, um, the Czech Republic, and it's the Dolny Vestonice. Um, there were several of these figurines, but this is just one example of them. And then we'll also say that the cave um, pottery in China is the original. Um, then we move on to Neolithic cultures. So um, in 9000 BC, you have ceramic making beginning in Central America. And we also have about a thousand years after that glazes getting discovered in Egypt. And that was through actually overheating pottery. So it was an accident. Um, they overheated their pottery. Glaze kind of formed on the surface from the extra silica um, kind of melting and reforming on the outside as it cooled. And then that's how the Egyptians discovered um, glaze. And then they also discovered glass. And that's gonna come into play later. Um, in 7,000 BC, it was important that the Tang Dynasty made glazed earthenware and porcelain. And then Neolithic culture developed agricultural um, settlements and communities around fertile plots of land. So all of that is gonna make 
um, a larger need for pottery. So pottery starts popping up all over the world and lots of people are using it. Um, ceramic making spreads from Central America to the Southeast Indians living in North America. So um, while a lot of this is going to be kind of centralized to um, Europe or Eurasia, basically, um, because you've got, you know, like this connected landmass, this is also happening in the Americas as well. So you have, um, you know, separately those people discovering clay and making pottery and then it kind of spreading south. Um, so I just talked about glaze and how it was discovered. Um, once they kind of discover glass, they also start to discover that they can use oxides and natural pigment, pigments to create colors in the glaze. So thanks to um, the Egyptians, we are able to do a lot of cool things with our pottery. Um, they also had a turnet, but we're not exactly sure if the Egyptians were the ones that invented it. Probably not. Um, pottery spreads across Eurasia from 6,000 to 5,000 BC. So um, it spread west from East Asia, reaching Mesopotamia, and then it moved on to North Africa around 6,000 BC. Um, so that would be Egypt, and then um, going to West Africa, um, and then there is a debate that maybe West African people um, discovered pottery on their own separately to store grain um, when they started farming. And then um, pottery reached Greece around 5000 BC. Um, and that's important because the Greeks were actually the people who became the best at pottery, according to historians. Um, okay, so people who ate Fish and shellfish were also making pottery in Brazil around 55,000 BC. So like I said, popping up everywhere. Um, and so you have um, people in like Central America, maybe South North America. Um, they were um, credited with discovering pottery and kind of pushing it farther south. And then you also have people in Brazil um, discovering pottery as well, probably and pushing it farther north. Um, and then we also know that the Cherokee and the Missi Mississippians um, were making pottery around 45,000 BC. Um, people on the Pacific side of South America started to make pottery about the same time as the Mississippi Mississippians and the Cherokee. So, um, you know, it's popping up everywhere. We're not really sure who invented it, who traded with who, and who gave the knowledge to who, and did they all just kind of discover it on their own? There were certain things like that that were like kind of inevitable for mankind to discover. And so um, the knowledge didn't necessarily have to be shared because it wasn't super complicated or complex. Um, it was kind of a natural discovery that was gonna happen no matter what. Um, after that, you have the Bronze Age. So the Bronze Age started in China around 17,000 BC, and um, they learned how to mine copper and tin to make bronze weapons, which are much stronger than stone weapons, which would make them a more dominant culture. Um, labor also started to organize. Um, there were a lot of revolutionary things invented during this time. Um, metal craftsmen, weavers, and um, things like baskets were being made and potters were needed. Farmers had to produce more food because they needed to feed those people as well. So instead of just farming for your own family, you would farm for a whole community um, and then you would sell it and there was more trade and there would also be more travel and exchange of information. So a lot of really interesting things are happening, happening to humanity at this time. Um, so you have the Bronze Age and classical antiqu antiquity so um, you have around 4,000, so um, not too long after what we just saw. And as you see, like this is an important time, a lot of things happen. Um, the potter's wheel and closed kilns are being used by the Chinese and the Middle Eastern people. Um, pottery appears in Northern South America in 2000 BC. In 1500 BC, glass objects, um, objects that are purely glass are first made in Egypt. Um, and then shortly after that, in 1050 to 450 BC, Greek pottery is at its peak. So we talked about the different styles of Greek pottery that kind of covers that whole time period right there in that one little uh, statement. 
then um, in 700 to 400 BC, so around the same time that the Greeks are really great at pottery, you have early ceramic sculpture peaking in Italy. So pottery is peaking in Greece, sculpture is peaking in Italy, um, and the Etrus Etruscans um, are the people who really um, took modeling lifelike figurines or um, life-size figures to the next level. Now later on the Greeks, and we won't really get super into that, but the Greeks and the Romans, so the Italians, um, they kind of swapped back and forth, like who is the best, but you also had a lot of stuff going on with sculpture with marble um, in different mediums than just clay. So um, we're going to say that ceramic sculpture peaked in Italy with the Etruscans, that's usually the generally agreed upon um, standard right there. Then um, in West Africa, you have people making knock heads, mostly in Nigeria. Um, and this started in a village named Knock. That's why they're called knock heads. And so you also have around the same time, maybe a little bit after, um, African people who probably didn't have any interaction with those Etruscans making um, pretty sophisticated sculptures as well out of clay. Um, but theirs are, you know, kind of what African art is known for, slightly more exaggerated. Um, there were certain human features that they enlarged to make, um, you know, a point about their people and what they valued. So the ancient potter's will. We're not really sure who invented it. Um, we do know that at some point people had to start using leaves to turn their pottery more easily. I'm sure y'all have had that experience where it gets stuck. Um, then they created turnets and then they created the kick wheel. We think that it was invented in Ur, which is Mesopotamia. Um, we're not exactly sure when it was invented and there is debate about where it was invented, but we're just gonna say for the purpose of this court, course, um, Ur, Mesopotamia is where the potter's wheel was invented. Um, you have the slow wheel around 3000 BC, um, which would also be at the beginning of the Bronze Age. So you had people that needed to make pottery faster. Now we call it the slow wheel because in comparison to what we have now, it's slow, but it was faster than what they could do by hand, coil building at the time. And um, you would use a platform made of wood and you um, would be able to make pottery pretty quickly once you became skilled at it. Um, we also know that some people in Central America invented it independent of what was going on in Asia. So like I said, it was one of those kind of inevitable things that humankind was going to discover. Um, by 2000 BC, almost all potters in Europe, Asia, and North Africa were using the fast wheel instead. Um, it is also a platform, but it has an axle. So it spins like a top and you can start spinning it with a push or a kick. Um, you could also wrap string around it and then throw, um, like if you had, a, sorry, if you had a string wrapped around it and then you had a string tied to a rock, you could throw the rock and it would spin it like a top. And that is actually why it is called throwing um, because usually men were potters and they would throw this heavy stone to kind of start the fast wheel. Um, then um, they could, you know, throw a lot like we do now just with a fast wheel. Um, pots got cheaper because they were faster and easier to make. And um, sometimes they would actually use children that were enslaved um, to make cheap pottery. Um, kind of a sad fact about early human history. Um, so because we have the wheel, pottery started spreading everywhere. And so then you have a lot of confusion of, oh, this culture made this because we found it here. Oh wait, no, actually this culture made it and they traded it with them. Um, and so you have pottery kind of moving around and this is true in Eurasia and this is also true in the Americas. All right, now let's kind of fast forward to classical antiquity. Um, and talk about what's going on there. So you have the Iron Age going on and um, people um, made tools from iron, which is even stronger than bronze. And it began in the Middle East and Southeastern Europe around 12,000 BC. And then it did not actually show up in China until around 600 BC. Um, and it changed a lot of things. So what you need to know about this time period is that this is when Greek pottery was at its um, peak and Greek pottery is known as the zenith or the best of ancient pottery. 
So in Greek pottery, we've already talked about this, so I'm going to go over it pretty quickly. Um, you have the proto-geometric style, um, which is just very basic painted on geometric designs. Then um, you get the geometric style, and you have things like meanders, which is that very um, stereotypical Greek design where it looks almost like a maze, and you've got like little zigzag lines. Um, and you've got the banding, and you've got like really small, tiny, repeated motifs. You have the ori orientalizing style. So um, whenever the Greeks kind of got influenced by places like Turkey um, and their way of making pottery and decorating pottery, they started adding things like lions and lotus flowers and palm trees, all of those, which are not really native to Greece. Um, so the Sphinx and the Griffin, all those they're getting from other cultures being influenced, adding that to their pottery. So the shape is very much Greek. It's still um, very small designs. Sometimes you still see the banding, um, but then you see all these things that are not really typical of Greek pottery because they were influenced by the Orient, basically Greek. Um, pottery or Greek potters kind of find themselves again. They find their voice. And it's just like as a student, when you um, find an artist for the first time that you really, really love and you kind of start copying them and then you realize, oh, that's not really my style. And so you take um, what you like about that artist and then you make it your own. That's what the Greeks did here. So they took um, the black figures, um, which it's arguable that, that maybe they were discovering those on those on their own without um, the orientalizing, um, style influence but um, regardless it came after so they started doing black figures where they would um, probably use a stencil like we did in class to paint the figures and then incise or use like a little small tool to kind of cut away some of the black um, but they would use black slip and they would do silhouettes depicting mythology and that is one of the things that they're really known for um, and then after that, you have kind of like an advancement where they started doing red figures. So more of that masking technique where they would cover up the terracotta clay um, and do black in the background and then take small, tiny paintbrushes and do um, details. They could also do carving. So sometimes um, they would paint the whole thing black and carve away. Um, so the figures were now in red. Then you have a very short time in Athens where people were using white ground figure where they were painting the entire pot white. They could use more color this way um, because they had a white ground to paint on. And um, this is because they discovered Kaelin slip probably from an Eastern influence. Um, okay, so you have Chinese developments and the Roman Empire. So um, you have the terracotta warriors um, being created, uh, which is an entire mausoleum mausoleum of people. And this is Qin Shi Huang. Um, I hope I said that correctly, um, which was an emperor in China who um, ordered this to be um, made. 7,000 life-size figurines. Just chew on that for a minute. Um, the Han Dynasty also invented celadon glaze. So a lot of exciting things were happening in China at this time. Um, a lot of times um, you'll hear China come up. In my opinion, China is probably one of the most important um, contributors to ceramics. And so even though um, the zenith of ancient pottery is Greece, um, China is equally, if not more important. Um, Japan's very important too, but I would argue that China is actually more important because they invented Celadon. Um, and right now the oldest dated pottery is from China. In 27 BC, the Roman Empire began. So like I was saying, like the age of um, the Bible, like the New Testament um, and Christ and all that. And you have like the change of BC to AD. So all that's about to happen. All right. So um, Phoenicians invented glass blowing, which made, makes glass cheap enough to be a competitor with pottery. So you don't really see a lot of developments in pottery during this time because glass kind of takes over. Um, and then potters actually began making pottery in molds instead of painting it. So that also kind of changes pottery. So the development of molds as a you know, possible method of making pottery instead of a turnet or a slow wheel or a fast wheel. So these things kind of shape the way that pottery 
goes for it. And we're actually going to get to try using a mold in ceramics too. All right. After that, you have the common era. So the birth of Christ marks the beginning of the common era um, or AD. And you have the North African pottery trade is really the next important thing that goes on. So around 100 AD, most pottery is used in the Roman Empire. Um, but it's made in North Africa and shipped by boat, probably because it is more cost effective to do it that way. Uh, you have the Arab invasion of North Africa around 700 AD, and this ended the North African pottery trade. And so um, mediocre pottery was locally made again for some time in the West, but really there's not anything exciting going on in the West. Um, the use of pottery was still spreading, reaching different parts of Africa, like the Congo in 900 AD. Um, but there are still parts of the world where people relied entirely on baskets. Um, then you also have around 400, the Japanese making the Haniwa warrior figures like we talked about in Ceramics 1. Um, you also have a lot of stuff happening in America where um, pottery is you know, spreading. But then in 1540, so I skip ahead quite a bit, um, the Spanish conquer the Americas and the prehistoric period of Native American pottery ends at that point. Um, because of the Europeans, they kind of um, destroy that pottery making. So you don't see any ancient pottery being made in the Americas at that point. So if you go to a museum, um, nothing should be dated past that point. In 1500, the teapot can be traced to China um, during the Ming Dynasty. So once again, there's China inventing something really revolutionary for pottery. Um, and then in 1550, you also have synthetic refractories for furnaces being used to make steel, glass, ceramics, and cement. So these refractories really um, are a great advancement for um, mankind. Burnishing comes from um, North America during that time. And then we also see porcelain, which is a big development. So porcelain comes from the Sui dynasty, and I don't think I said that correctly, in China. Um, and this happens around 700 AD, going back a little bit. And then you also have um, lead glaze getting invented. And the reason is porcelain was beautiful but it was also expensive and hard to come by the clay and porcelain has a tendency to warp and crack. So due to the popularity of porcelain and how beautiful it was, um, people started trying to come up with other ways to get the same effect. So they invented lead glazes, which were white um, and shiny so they could make a normal piece of pottery look more like porcelain and sell it for more. You also have tin glaze, which is an important discovery by um, Islamic potters, and then um, lusterware. So being able to add a metallic look to your pottery is, um, well, you can do that thanks to um, the Islamic potters. Um, so we're thinking that the Assyrians were the first, but then a lot of times you say, um, you know, when you do research, it will say that Turkey um, discovered this. So um, there's a little bit of debate there, but basically Islamic potters. Then you also see a very unique recognizable style develop in Iraq. So places like Persia, Syria, and Syria, sorry, in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and Muslim potters became known for their decorative tiles with geometric designs. Um, so actually in our culture today, you will see a lot of this design influence on pottery and tiles and bathrooms and different things like that. All right, so we're gonna go forward to the Italian Renaissance. So the Italian Renaissance was important um, for a lot of things in art, but um, then it wasn't really um, in, you know, it wasn't really influenced by clay because clay was kind of considered a low material. So some artists used it, but their finished products would be made out of marble. Um, you do have tea gaining popularity um, around this time and a little bit after. So you have Dutch importers um, bringing tea to Europe. 
Then you have tea first being produced in Germany and spreading to France and England um, in 1700, which also means that tea wares become popular. So think about all of the teapots and tea sets that you see in probably your grandma's house or your mom's house um, in a china cabinet today. All that is really thanks to the spread of tea and tea wares from China to Europe. In 1754, you have Josiah Wedgwood, and he is credited with the industrialization of pottery manufacturing. And he's very important. Um, you can actually see a display of his work in St. Louis, um, but you can also see different pieces of his even in places like Memphis, um, but he is from England. So um, he was really big to pottery making. He had this entire factory where they would mass produce pottery um, with tons of people who were really skilled artisans and craftsmen working on the pottery. In 1776, hopefully that date sounds familiar to you, Americans broke from the English tradition when they gained their independence. So the teapot is actually not as important as our, in our culture as it is in English culture because we were trying to break away from the father country. Um, okay, so basically 1800 to present, you have the modern potter's wheel. So the fast wheel was invented and improved upon by Europeans. A crankshaft was applied to potter's wheel. The wheel was improved upon until we have electric wheels um, today. That was invented eventually. Both types are in use, the kick wheel and the electric wheel. After that, you have crafts, craftsmen guilds. Um, you also have Anna the Duchess of Bedford popularizing afternoon tea in England. Um, so that woman right there is who we have to thank for how popular um, pottery is in England. Um, you also have a lot of things going on with art workers versus craftsmen and is pottery art or is pottery craft. Um, and that debate kind of goes on for a while longer. Um, in 1890, you have the famous George Orr from Mississippi um, become famous in Biloxi. Then um, you also have the arts and crafts movement in America from 1900 to 1916. So um, this is when ceramics really changes um, from being um, an art to craft and back to an art, um, but basically this has been going back and forth for a while. And so um, really after 1916, um, clay is once again considered like a craft material and very common. Think about um, someone making like very serious art out of yarn. It's just very rarely done because it's considered so crafty. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of people breaking tradition nowadays, but at the time, if you wanted to be taken serious as an artist, you did not work with clay. Um, it wasn't until later on that some artists changed that. So in the modern era, you have several famous artists um, that kind of revolutionize the clay world. And so you have Picasso using clay to make fine art, and that really kind of helped open up the door and legitimize the medium. Um, there are also several other artists that we credit with this, like Beatrice Wood, who we talk about in Ceramics One, Peter Volkos, who we also talk about in Ceramics One. Um, you also have Betty Woodman doing this, and then you have Robert Arneson doing this around 1960, so a little bit later. Um, Viola Frey is, an also important, is also an important ceramic artist who kind of legitimized clay. Um, the Terracotta Army is not actually discovered until 1974, so fairly recently. And then you have today. So what are people saying about clay today? Um, they're basically saying that it's legit. Um, you can make fine art out of clay. So you were living in a wonderful time um, to be a clay artist. People like it because it gives them a lot of freedom and it gives them this really tactile quality to their work. Um, and they like how it records touch. Um, there are some really awesome contemporary artists working with clay. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can email me or contact me on Schoology. Have a great day.